Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 10, and this is Session 6. Okay, so we left off with uh, the last session talking about the way that the intercessory ministry of the Spirit takes place. It is by Him leading us. Can I just remind you that Romans chapter 8, verse 4, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He is leading us uh, through the forms of doctrine in God's Word, and um, he is teaching, uh, we're, and we're, we're responding to what we understand about that doctrine. All right, so now let's move back to Romans 8. I did that already. Verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I know what that sounds like. I've told you this before, so I'll just take a moment to remind you. It sounds like the way the Spirit is making intercession is by groanings which cannot be uttered. But we already have established that what the Spirit is doing is teaching us, leading us, instructing us. And, and He may be up there groaning, but you're not learning anything through that now. So... Let's take a look at what these groanings are. Actually, they're not his, they're ours. So, and, and this picks up out of verse 23. You've already heard verse 23, so here it is. And not only they, talking about the whole creation, the heaven and the earth, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. Now, notice it says how we're groaning. Within ourselves. That is a different type of thing. Remember last week when I groaned audibly for you? You're so impressed with that, right? I really have that groaning down. But this is not audible groans. What we're doing is groaning within ourselves. And... And, and what does that mean? Let me take you back to the Oxford English Dictionary. The number one definition, to groan inwardly, this is, just, this, doesn't, this is not a definition for groan within ourselves. This is just a definition for groan. To groan inwardly in oneself, in the spirit, with the heart. Now, this is a different kind of definition. By the way, when, when they gave this definition, you know what one of the examples they gave? It was right out of your King James Bible. So that was the very definition that they were looking at there. Now, let me show you this next one. This is, this is definition number six. To express earnest longing by groans to yearn or long. Well, look, what are we groaning about? Just take a look. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So let's just take those definitions and work with that. If this is about waiting for the redemption of our body, wouldn't it be true that we are grown, I mean, we're grown within ourselves, so that number one definition is definitely true. We're groaning in our heart or in our spirit. But that groaning is not the groaning of pain. It's a different groaning. This is the groan of longing or yearning. For what? For this session to be over so you can go home. No. This is the groaning or yearning for the redemption of our body. Yes? In other words, it's kind of like saying, now that I know that's what I'm going to get, I'm really looking forward to getting that. That's the groan that's taking place here. And by the way, if you're groaning inwardly, Back up. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. If we're groaning in our heart, then it's not groaning how? Outwardly or audibly. 
or verbally. It's not that kind of groaning. So look, let me back up. So the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's our groanings. I just told you three verses prior that we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. That's why those groanings can't be uttered. This is not the Spirit somehow praying for us with some mystical kind of groaning that cannot be said. If that's what, and by the way, that's how most people see the verse. And if that's the case, then I have a couple of questions. Number one, why can't they be uttered? I mean, if that's what it is, why can't they be uttered? Are you telling me that God the Spirit can't say it? How come? See, that seems a little ridiculous to me. The second thing is, I'm not really sure why the Spirit up in heaven praying by groaning is somehow helping you to deal with your infirmities. I don't get that. And there's nothing in the Word to explain that. In fact, everything else that gets said about this actually doesn't line up with that interpretation of the verse. But the things we've been talking about, I can show you dozens of verses that line up with that. All right, so I'm just trying to make the point. because So what is he doing? He is making intercession for us with these groanings that are not uttered because they're within ourselves. They're not audible groanings. What, where is that taking place? Well, if, the, if I'm right, if I'm right, and that's the definition, then he's saying that... Uh, let me get to it here. Um, did I not... There it is. To groan inwardly in oneself, in the spirit, with the heart. And if that groaning is taking place in our heart, now that's verse 26. Look, that, that was in verse 26. Take a look at this next verse. And he that searcheth the hearts. See, if that's the groaning, if the groaning is taking place in your heart, then what God is now doing is he is searching the hearts. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In other words, if you're going to learn how to pray for the things you ought to pray for, you're going to have to be taught that. And if you get taught that, guess what? That'll be according to the will of God. You'll be praying exactly in line with how God means for you to do that. But the point I want to make here is, what in the world is God searching our hearts for? What, is he just... It, does that mean he's just in there rattling around somewhere and he just happens to be in there? If you're searching for something, what are you doing? Are you looking for something specific? Yeah. <laughs> of course you are. What is God searching our hearts for? What is he looking for? Yes, exactly. He's looking to see... If, if we're taking what has been said and understanding it and believing it and now implementing it into our life. That's what he's looking for. He's looking to see if that's what's taking place. And I think that makes perfect sense. So that covers the review for sonship prayer. By the way, have you ever had a day when you've longed for a glorified body? Some of us have. And guess what? That, that what was written in the verse is, has already taken place for you. That you groan within yourself waiting for the adoption. I mean, that may well be true. Okay, so now I want to talk to you about how prayer is a very important part, a vital part of the word working in us. Because as we do this, as we do this, what is the Spirit doing? That, what, is the, what, what, what is the Word doing? We know what the, the, the Spirit is the one that facilitates this, 
But the word, here's what the Bible says, is effectually working. What is, it, what is effectually working? When the Bible uses that term, what is effectually working? It, it's more than just effective, because something can be effective without being effectual. So it's important to know the words. So what's the difference between being effective and being effectual? Anybody remember a component of that? Several components to that. You mean you haven't memorized everything I've ever told you? Oh my goodness, this is so... Effectually at its core means it will do what it was designed to do and it cannot be substituted for and it cannot be improved upon. If it's effectual, it is the fullness of what can happen with it. Something can be effective and not be effectual. In other words, it might be effective, but something else could make it better. Something else could improve upon it. Or you could substitute for something else. But when you're talking about the word effectually working in us, now you're talking about it doing something that nothing else can do. And so, uh, what, I want, so what I want to do now is talk about how prayer is a part of this. This is all based on understanding and believing and living out of the word how prayer works into that process. And since we're about to get back into the education in Romans chapter 12, it is going to be important that we have this concept down. So, I actually got here quicker than I thought I would be. So now I want to give you the first of the reasons about why we have to be taught to pray. Does anybody want to give me one right off the bat? Just out of your head, just thinking, just general idea. Okay, all right, all right. And that's why, we pr that's why we pray. But why, my question is, why do we need to be taught to pray? Oh, that's good. We've been taught wrong. Anybody else got something? Okay, our natural inclination is not correct. That's good. Right, okay, that's good. All right, so let me give you these reasons. Number one, because according to our apostle, <laughs> we don't know how to pray, what to pray for as we ought. In other words, he just said it. So the number one reason for me is because in the inspired canon of Scripture, Paul wrote down that we don't know. Now, the reason we don't know what you were just saying is why he was able to say that. So let's, let's talk about that. So here's the first one. Because as Gentiles, we will never figure out prayer on our own. Now, wait a minute. As Gentiles. What is a Gentile? There's only two flavors of people in the world. Flavors, I'm sorry. That smacks of cannibalism, doesn't it? I don't mean that. I have that little phrase in my head. I just use it for everything. But there are. There are two flavors of people in the world. What are they? There you go. Jews and Gentiles. What constitutes a Jew? Descendant of Abraham. If he's a descendant of Abraham, he's a Jew. If he's not, it doesn't matter what other nationality he is. He can be French or Spanish or Italian or American or Guatemalan or Australian. or It doesn't matter. All the rest of them are Gentiles. And because of that, there is something about us being Gentiles that makes it the natural thing that we're going to pray wrong and we're never going to figure out how to do it on our own. We're going to have to be taught how to do it right. Now, when it, now, I know I said that, and you don't want to take my word for it. So I want to show it to you. So we'll go through the scripture with this. And, and by the way, it's true of all the Gentiles. It doesn't matter where in the world they live. 
or does it matter about their upbringing, they all have wrong thinking when it comes to prayer. Do the Jews know how to pray? Yes, they do. They do. Because they were, they were given instructions. The, the, there is no prayer book for the Gentile. In fact, if you were a Gentile, for, for the most part, this would be true for 99% of the Gentiles, or maybe 99 point something of the Gentiles, what, did you, what do you know is true about almost every Gentile? Go, go, you can go back in history at any point in time. That's right. That before the dispensation of grace, Gentiles, by and large, did not know the true and living God. So what, what God did they worship? <laughs> There's thousands of them. The Jews didn't come up with those. Those gods were the Gentile gods. Remember what God warned Israel about? Don't worship the gods of the Gentiles. Because out of the million possible gods that could be worshipped, the Gentiles worshipped them all but one. <laughs> the true one. <laughs> That's, I mean, and you remember that was a result of the Tower of Babel. God gave them up and gave them over. But, so that was true of all the Gentiles. So here's something Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.22. Or Ephesians 2.1. Um, I, guess I, I guess I left that out. So you got it in your notes? All right, let's just read it there. 1 Corinthians 1.22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks... Seek after wisdom. Now when he says the Greeks, who's he talking about there? Gentiles. Yeah, he's talking about Gentiles. And, and so, when they seek after wisdom, by the way, what does that mean, they seek after wisdom? It means they're very impressed by wisdom. That really registers with them. Unfortunately, the kind of wisdom that the Gentiles had was what kind? Yeah, the man's wisdom, the wisdom of this world. It wasn't God's wisdom. This had their own kind of wisdom. And because they were impressed with that, and because that's what kind of lodged in their thinking, let me ask you this. When they formulated prayers and thought about praying, what guided their understanding of that? It was man's wisdom, or the wisdom of the world. They always thought certain things about it. And so... I'm just making the point here that if they were ever going to get it right, they were going to have to be taught. Now the Ephesians 2 scripture. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past, now here he's talking to the Gentiles, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And you know, Here's what this is saying. When you Gentiles in time past, when you were unsaved, you walked or you lived your life according to the course of this world. Who put the course of the world into motion? Satan, when he, when he functioned as the prince of the power of the air. He's the one that put the... So if he's the one that informed their thinking about praying... By the way... Satan doesn't care if you're religious. He's a religious creature himself. He doesn't care if you're religious. He loves it when you get it wrong. If you want to pray to a God, hey, you can pray to a hundred. He's good with that. And if you finally get the true and living God, what he's really tickled is for you to continue to pray to the true and living God the way you prayed to all those things that weren't actually gods at all. Just continue to be ignorant. And continue to fly. You know what? That tickles him to death. Because that's kind of an insult, isn't it? Here's God's own people. They don't even know how to talk with him. Even though they've got a book that contains scripture that instructs them, they have a mindset as Gentiles that overrides many times what they would find in the scripture. So what I want to do is just remind us really quickly about how we were in Adam. Because it's in connection with this verse right here. So, in Adam, now by the way, we're talking about not our justification here, we're talking about our sanctification. That'd be a whole different set. 
But in Adam, the way we would live for God was an abomination. There wasn't anything we could do that was acceptable to God. But when we got saved, we got put into Christ. And because we are in Christ, we have now been given a sanctification unto functional life that allows us to live for God in a way that is pleasing to Him that we could never do before. The first component part of that is we used to be servants of sin, but after we got saved, that relationship was severed and we are made dead to sin. You know I'm taking this right out of the verses. The second component part is we were free from righteousness. Now we're alive unto God. He's imputed the righteousness of His Son to our account. And the third one, and the one I'm really after here, is before we were saved, we walked according to the course of this world. That's the course that Satan laid down, and we just went tripping merrily down the way, oblivious to what it was. We had no real idea. And how would you know unless someone told you about it? So here it is. But then, when you get saved, you find out you're no longer supposed to walk according to the prince of the power of the air as he laid down the course of this world but you're supposed to live as an adopted son or daughter of your heavenly father. That's a whole different thing. Well, just to say it that way, so back to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation, or the way we lived our lives in time past, in the lust of our flesh, ful fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. And that's the point I'm making to you that we are naturally that way just because of who we are as Gentiles. What is going on in the mind of the unsaved person here? It says, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. What's going on in a person's mind here? Right. Man's wisdom or the wisdom of this world is going on in there, which means how much truth is in there? None. Not in those, not in those areas. He may know math, and he may know language, and he may know science, and he may learn those things. But when it comes to this, he is empty-headed and empty-hearted. All he has is the lie. And that's a construct on purpose. That's what the course of this world is designed to produce in the mind of a person. Now, let me ask you a question. Here's a guy... He's been living according to the course of this world, and then one day he hears the gospel and he trusts Jesus Christ as his all-sufficient Savior. Did he get saved? Yes, he did. So now I'm going to ask you this. Here it is. How much of all of that old thinking that he used to have in his mind, how much is still in his mind? Every bit of it. Not one bit of it. The only thing he knows differently now is about salvation. He understands the gospel. That's all he knows. What might he have thought before? He might have thought, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a bunch of good works, and I know I do some bad things. And when I get to heaven, God's going to put my good works on one side of the scale and my bad works on the other. And whichever one outweighs the other, that will determine if I go to heaven or hell. Was that true? No. But that's part of what's in his mind because as a, he just doesn't know anything except the wisdom the world conjures up for him. But when he hears the gospel and he realizes, oh, that's not how that works, but, but salvation is a free gift of grace, then he can be saved. But that's the only part of his thinking that got corrected about these matters. He can, now, the, the way he thought that he would live for God before is still the way he thinks he's going to live for God. He's going to have to be taught about that. In fact, the very status change that we just looked at that happened here, he won't even figure that out. He will, I, I will call you to witness. Just about any preacher you want to name, most of them are oblivious about the component parts of their own sanctification. Couldn't tell you where in the Bible to find them and couldn't identify them and couldn't write them down on a piece of paper. That's how much the, the, the godly thinking contained in the Scripture has not come into their thinking. They're still thinking about it the way they mostly thought about it all along. Only now, they're just doing kind of a Christianized version of it. And that's a sad thing.
So, when it comes to being, I think Clifford mentioned this earlier, I'm not sure who it was, but when it comes to being an adopted son, what's the first thing God begins to change in order to produce godliness in us? Yep, godly thinking. You know why? I mean, it only makes sense when you understand what's going on. All you have before is the thinking that came to you because you were following the course of this world. So the first thing God does is change your thinking. And then He changes your living out of that new thinking. Not going to happen, not going to really happen any other way. All right, so um, let me give you a couple of... Um, oh, I mentioned this verse a couple times, so let me just read it to you because we're talking about being taught to pray. Oh, did I do that one? This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. If something is vain, vanity, what is that? What's the, the root definition of that? Worthless, empty, there's nothing, there's nothing there. He's not talking about they don't understand facts in the world. He's talking about this issue in the vanity of their mind. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance. If you're ignorant of something, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you're stupid. What does it mean? It means you don't know. In other words, you know what? They're just things they don't know. Look, this whole passage is talking about this. The vanity of their mind. That's just, it's empty and devoid of what God wants to have there. Having their understanding darkened. How in the world can they understand it? When they're thinking about it the wrong way. Alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. They just don't know because of the blindness of their heart. That's the way Gentiles were before they got saved. That is not a resume for how good a Christian you will be now that you are saved. All of that needs to be changed. All of that needs to be remedied. Okay. So, now, now, I hope I didn't leave this verse out. I sure hope I didn't. Luke 11. And it came to pass that as he was praying at a certain place, when he ceased, well, this is Jesus, one of his disciples came unto him, said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. I'm just showing you that that's always been the case. Why did the disciples of John need to learn how to pray? Test question. Why did the disciples of Jesus say, teach us to pray? Why did they need to learn how to pray? Because, because say that again? They, okay, they just got saved. That's right. What did you say, Linda? You don't remember what you said? Well, they were. They did, well, I said they were, they were given instructions on how to pray. Yes. At that time, they didn't. What did... I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood your question. I thought we were talking about the little flock. You're just talking about Jews in general? I'm sorry, I misunderstood what we were doing. Because the Jews in general... How did, that, how did Peter, James, and John, and all the others... How, where did they learn to pray? Ah, from the religious leaders in Israel. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the chief priests, all those. That's where they learned. And so what was going to have to happen? That was going to have to be corrected, right? I'm going to show you some of the verses in which, in which that takes place. So, so he says... Um, Oh, you know what? I, I keep missing these verses, and I don't know why. So let me just make this point. We also, just like them, I'm going to come back to this, need to learn how to pray. And in order to do that, we have to have something happen. And here it is, Ephesians 4.23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, our thinking's got to be changed, doesn't it? Okay. I'm sorry, I saw that word renewed and it made me think of something. So here's what, and so what is the problem with the Gentiles? The problem with the Gentiles is that they're superstitious. And people still are. 
very superstitious. That's just our nature. It's, <clears throat> it's who we are as Gentiles. Let me just finish this one little bit and we'll be done. The superstitious nature of the Gentiles... No, I'll wait and do it next week. Look, we're going to go over to the book of Acts, and Paul is going to go to Athens, and he's going to see that the people there in Greece are worshiping every god imaginable. In fact, the cliche in that day was, it was easier to find the image of a god than it was to find a person. They even had an altar built to the unknown God in case they missed one. Let's just make sure we get them all. So when Paul shows up, you know what he says? Hey, you know the one that you said the unknown God? I need to tell you about him. Because <laughs> believe me, you guys are very superstitious. And we do. And it pervades every area. Even intelligent people do that. You know the old deal about knock on wood? Do you know what that was about? That was about devils being present and getting rid of those so that those spirits don't influence somehow. We felt that knocking on wood. And people do that today. In fact, they do it, and they do it so often, it's an automatic thing, and they'll be saying, you know what, I'm uh, make it over there to the store if it's not closed. And they just do that. I don't even think about it anymore. It's just something they automatically do. Don't walk under a ladder. Don't let a black cat walk in front of you. Throw salt over my shoulder. Oh, don't, you know. I mean, you got all of those things going on. But you even have athletes now. These are my lucky socks. I got to wear these socks because when we played the Ravens last time, these were the socks that I was wearing. And I had three sacks. So I, I, I got to wear these socks. Or I have this ritual that I have to do. Now look, if he wears his lucky socks, and he goes through his ritual, and the ravens beat him this time, you know what he'll still do next time? He'll wear his lucky socks. And he'll go through the ritual. And these are, these are I'm putting it in quotes, sane, intelligent people. But by nature, we Gentiles are very, very superstitious. And that pervades more of our Christian lives than we like to admit. And it certainly pervades into our prayer life. And Paul's going to have to correct all that. So when we come back, we're going to start looking at that issue. All right? And this is what I told you we would do. We're going to be looking at five reasons that... Um, we don't know what to pray for as we ought. These are, you might be able to add a reason or two to the list, but I think these are the five biggest. So anyway, we'll do that when we come back. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be done. Father, thank you for the opportunity to study your word and to look into it and, and, and understand what it is saying to us. We want to pray as we ought. We want to pray with intelligence, that we understand what it is you're doing and why you're doing it that way. We want to cooperate with that because, Lord, we really need that to happen with us. Not so that we can get stuff, but so that we can become what you have designed for us to be as your sons and daughters. And we thank you for the privilege of that. And, Lord, I'm especially thankful for my friends, the folks that gather here that are engaged in an education. They understand what it is that they're in and what it is we're working toward, and we're privileged to be able to do so in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, see you next time.